Hello, and welcome to The Foundation, a Parks People podcast, presented by the National Association of Park Foundations. And now, your host and executive director of the National Association of Park Foundations, Kevin Korenthal. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Foundation, the Park People's podcast. Uh, I'm Kevin Korenthal, the executive director of the National Association of Park Foundations, and I have the supreme pleasure of having as my guest today, uh, the person that I replaced, well, he's irreplaceable, but I took over the executive director role from uh, Donald Ortal. We'll get to him for a second. In a second, I just want to remind everyone uh, that the NAPF is standing by to meet all the needs of your foundation and your, your agency's relationship with the foundation. So don't forget to reach out to us if you ever have any questions. All of our contact information is on the website at the-napf.org. So let's get into today's, today's podcast. Welcome, Donald. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. I always like to begin at the beginning. And the beginning was the day you were born, 66 years ago tomorrow. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think I, I think we've just dated myself, but that's all right. I'm good with that. I'm a young 66. Right, right here on the live uh, podcast. I'm so sorry. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, it, it's great to be involved uh, still, Kevin, through, through your work uh, with the National Association of Park Foundations. Um, my role in Parks and Rec actually did start almost, almost. Well, that was going to be my next question. Take us through how you got to where you ended up leading the NAPF. Yeah, um, you know, I live in the western suburbs of Chicago, and we moved from the city uh, out to the western suburbs which was approximately 28 miles directly west of the city of Chicago. So if you're ever visiting Chicago and you're, you're, you're having a, a soda on the 95th floor of the John Hancock building and look directly west 28 miles, I'll be waving at you. <laughs> 28 miles doesn't seem like a long way, but back in the 1960s, it was prairie. You had the city of Chicago and you had uh, you know the near west side, for instance, and that was it. You know, things have grown so much since then. But my folks had an opportunity to move us uh, from the city, um, which was convenient for them, quite honestly, because they were working in the city. But they moved us out to the suburbs when I was three. So around the first part of the 1960s, I grew up in what we call today our parks and rec system in West Suburban Addison, Illinois. But back then it was nothing but prairie. And I remember that specifically because I would ride my bikes, uh, my, ride my bike on the hills that were created from the, the dirt that was uh, um, stored from the construction that was going on. Uh, that was one of our parks, uh, a hill. Um, you know, we, we were playing in prairies. Our, our slides, our swings were nothing then what they are like today. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I found myself and my friends as well, really enjoying uh, the time from the from from when we would get out of school to the time we were called home for dinner. You know, just playing in our parks. And um, as a as a young teen, I actually became a um, a volunteer. You know, I was volunteering for our park district for um, gosh several years as a young kid. Became an adult volunteer as a soccer coach, uh, and then. Um, he, he took a role more professionally in the nonprofit sector. Uh, so I grew up in the park and rec system uh, in, in Addison. I eventually became a uh, an appointed commissioner on our park district, which is our taxing body here in, in, in Addison for, for parks and rec, and then became an elected official and served another six years on the board uh, before I rolled off the board. I've stayed in... Um, the park and rec system through the work that we've done in, in forming the National Association of Park Foundations. And, and I'm just excited that now as a senior citizen, I could continue to enjoy the parks um, as, as in the fashion in which they were intended to be enjoyed. Well, that's interesting. You should bring that up. It's almost like we have an ability as people working in the park and recreation space to ensure the longevity of the infrastructure that we our children and our children's children and our children's children's children, God pray, yeah. will be able to enjoy down the road as well. 
responsibility from generation to generation, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. So, I mean, you, you, you brought up a little bit about uh, park district, and that might be a, a concept that's not as well known to some areas of the country as it is to places like California and Illinois that use park districts. Can you give us a little information about the difference between a park district and say like a city park agency? Certainly. Um, and you're right. I mean, it, there's the, there's only a certain portion of our country that actually has gone to the benefits of a park district. Um, the state of Illinois, this little swatch of the Midwest that we're in, uh, California, there are some, perhaps maybe even Colorado, but taxing bodies, um, park districts differ from park departments that are actually under the mayor's budget, mm -hmm. whereas a park district is an actual levy against the taxes that people pay. Um, so uh, in, in, in Addison, we weren't always a park district. It was probably in the mid 60s, early 70s that we actually developed the park district, which is again, its own taxing body. And um, the main difference is the mayor doesn't oversee the park district budget, um, and and while that's while that's cool and it helps actually evolve park districts, the similarities are similar to the challenges that park departments and agencies across the country feel, and especially from a budgetary standpoint of view. Right, it makes a lot of sense to me that really the concept of the park foundation grew very quickly on the district side of that equation but has now been found to be just as valuable to to city park agencies and that kind of brings me to the to the question of the day and that really is you know what do you see as the primary benefits for park districts or park or any park agency um, when it comes to the possibility or the use of a park foundation that's a good question. It's one that actually, you know, comes up in conversations like what we're having now, as well as in group sessions at different conferences and things along those lines. Um, you know, the, the thing that I learned early on, uh, and by the way, the re one of the reasons why it, your comment about being heavy uh, in park districts when we, when the National Association of Park Foundations first got started is we cut our teeth right here in Illinois. Um, and we were learning as we were going along um, and we were learning from park districts, but quickly learned that there is a big difference between a park department and a park district. Not so much as much as a big difference between the need for a park foundation. And usually you'll find, not always, but usually you will find that when a group of people, uh, whether they're park uh, commissioners, elected officials, or whether they're appointed officials, but they serve the mayor on the park board. When these boards come together and, and start talking about the need for alternative funding, bingo, that's, that's when your park foundations and other sources of funding discussions come up. Enter the National Association of Park Foundations right then and there, and we can help the districts, departments, and agencies across the country actually establish their their foundations. Yeah, and, you know, and obviously, it always what always comes to mind as one of the primary benefits to an agency would be that you know the public might have a, you know misgivings about making donations directly to a city or a district, but would be very open to the idea of giving money, uh, even large sums of money or annual giving to a, a nonprofit, a 501c3. That, and, and also obviously grants, um, going out for you know, matching grants with the federal government or other, there are plenty of philanthropic organizations that also provide grants uh, to the park and rec space. So moving on, Donald, what, so we, we kind of talked a little bit about some of the advantages of a park foundation. How would an agency or a district come to the realization that it's a good time or maybe it's just community members, right? How, at, at what point is it a good time to start a park foundation? Well, let's take a look at it from the, the perspective of the park professional, right? Um, the park professional is inundated with citizen involvement, and that's a good thing to the point where our citizens in different community, different uh, neighborhood parks are kind of gathered amongst themselves in you know their backyard patios or whatever talking about how could they can improve their own local neighborhood park mm -hmm. 
when these friends groups, if you will, start percolating uh, under the surface, but yet the park department professional can recognize that this is happening and could be a good ear to those people, it's important, I think, that and it's an advantage to be able to form an umbrella organization called the Park Foundation that can give life to and a location within the park and rec culture to these friends groups that are kind of more loosely formed, if you will, right? Very involved, very passionate citizens, but not necessarily those um, to the level of a, of a, of a 501c3 mm -hmm. responsibilities of that. You know, I think that's one of the ways for our park professionals can, can identify that it's time to maybe look into starting a park foundation. As you mentioned, there's also times when, you know, donors can come to you, whether they're corporate donors, whether they're individual family foundations, or whether they're just individuals. And, and they will not give to the city government. They won't give to a, a park district, even though a park district can accept donations, but they won't give to a park district because of the perceived uh, connection with city government. So when, when a, a donor, and this is a real life story, actually, it was actually um, early on in the formation of the National Association of Park Foundations, there was a group, and I believe it was up in Wisconsin, called us up almost frantic saying we need to start a park foundation. We need to start a park foundation. Well, after discussions, I realized that it was, the reason was they had a major donor step forward and say they wanted to make a, a donation. And this donation was significant. My numbers on this kind of get confusing to me. It was either a $6 million donation for a development of a nine acre park, or it was a $9 million for us. I don't remember the exact, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, as soon as they became a park foundation, a 501c3, they were granted this money, this donation. And to this day, that, that park, which sits behind the donor's home, is now dedicated to her deceased husband. So right. when you have, when you have a, a support of that nature, come forward and say, you know, we just don't want to give to, that's another time to actually start a, a, a park foundation. Um, you know, it, it's important, I think, to note that no best time is, is equal, um, is the same in, in, from park department or park district or agency. But yet there's similarities here. There, you know, some, of your, some of your best practices in park foundations at the local level are started for some of the reasons that we're talking good, about. Good, good point, because you know, I bring up oftentimes the other side of the coin, um, not related to philanthropic funding, but rather uh, the need to better organize community members into volunteers. And so the Park Foundation that started here in McKinney, Texas, where I am, where NEPF's current headquarters are, um, started because groups of members throughout the community of McKinney wanted to get better organized and be able to uh, utilize small amounts of money to get equipment and be able to care for that equipment all under the blessing of the city of McKinney. So I've seen that as well. And I encourage that to uh, all of the park agencies out there that are yeah. interested. Maybe you don't see necessarily the, a large monetary benefit right now, but being able to organize volunteers is another thing you can do very well with a foundation. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, donations um, and, and citizen involvement um, don't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, so, I guess, large. Let me just use that word, right? It doesn't have to be a $9 million donation. Right. Uh, you know, your, your citizens and their involvement, um, it does take someone like a park professional and perhaps maybe the volunteers that sit on that board to realize is this a volunteer or is this an actual board member? Even though board members in most cases are volunteers, your volunteers sometimes bring to the table a, a expertise maybe to produce a 5K run or walk, but not yeah. necessarily to govern a multi-million dollar foundation or even a fifty thousand dollar foundation. Well, right? yeah, so and, and and don't also don't forget also the the ability to utilize tax funds that have been earmarked, you know, specifically for park infrastructure 
the park foundations can shepherd the use of those funds. And in many cases, better than the agency itself can. Um, And I bring that up because that's how, for instance, the McKinney Park Foundation was able to get its first round of funds to be able to purchase, you know, out here, our grasses grow very tall in the summer. So you need a lot of very large lawn mowers for it. That was how we were able to get a big amount of that equipment. Sure. Yeah, no, our our local park foundations are responsible for, and I shouldn't say responsible, meaning that it's that it's a duty of theirs, but um, are successful in in providing scholarships for kids who are or adults who might be economically challenged, but yet the foundation can provide scholarships so that those kids could play right or can be involved in uh, baton twirling uh, lessons or whatever. And the same can be said for adults as well. You know, the the idea of being able to um, be a, a willing recipient of donated land and acres of perhaps, yeah. you know, property that is, is um, you know, under- in will, yes. Yeah, I mean, underused waterways, underused uh, easements. Um, these are things that in, in some cases you're, can be facilitated because you have an actual park foundation. So let's, you know, let's switch gears now um, and talk a little bit about what it takes to become a foundation, because obviously, you know, you apply to the IRS and for, you know, you also take that paperwork to your state for a blessing in in that uh, capacity as well. But from your standpoint, I know you've done a lot of uh, work in building park foundations around the country. What does it take beyond that to get a successful foundation? And I, and I know that's the million dollar question and everybody wants the answer to it. But from your perspective, what do you think it takes on a basic level to get a successful foundation going? Yeah, you know, another great question. I mean, um, you know, in sessions at conferences or even in individual conversations um, after session or just in passing, these kind of com- uh, questions come up. And, you know, I'll go back to what I said uh, as a overarching answer to this question. No two park foundations at the local level are exactly alike, right? So what it might be, what might be important to one um, is maybe not necessarily as synergistic to, to another. But when you look at the best practices um, of some of the more optimally functioning local park foundations, whether they were just started last year or started last decade, what you find is, at least what I have found, was these all started with a really focused, serious, passionate group of citizens. Whether they were people who rolled off of an elected role or an appointed role, or whether they were, you know, uh, just moving into the community. Without this cohesive group of visionaries, if you will, from within the citizen level of the of the community, without those, you probably are really climbing uphill, right? But th- that's that's one of the best one of the thing characteristics of what I found um, is synonymous with with best practices in in successful and optimally functioning park foundations. Yeah, Another, well, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, you know, another another piece to that is 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 what do those volunteers, what do those passionate people bring? And this is, I'll go back to what I was saying before. Are they are they are they really adept at um, you know producing bake sales, or are they really adept at fundraising? Are they in the banking community? Yeah, yeah. Right. What do they bring to the table? You know, it, are they board members? And if they will. It, and what ha- what helps in the res- in this respect it, are are procedures and policies. Mm-hmm. And again, that's another best practice. If you've started your park foundation, you got all your legal papers in, but yet you lack a a a, a standard operating procedure manual, procedures, policies, etc. Right. Uh, you, you you don't give your park foundation the strength it needs to grow and succeed. So yeah, we, we talk we talk about we talk about the culture of the yeah. Park Foundation quite a bit. And those uh, founding documents and the operations manual that you speak of is really what holds the culture together for the preceding generations going forward after that original board is long past the gavel, if you will, onto the next board. It it does. Um you know, I describe it as as um not so much solely responsible for the culture. I describe it as 
solely responsible for the direction uh, uh, and, and the support of the mission, right? Um, culture is a big piece, another big piece of, of this, what's synonymous with optimally functioning, but it's it's not so much a culture, only, only a culture from within the park foundation. It's, it's a much bigger piece culture. If, if the park foundation is really well put together, but they're not included in the culture of the overall park department. Yeah. Yeah, we could talk all day about the memos and yes. Right. So, you know, that leads me to another best practice, if you will. And, it, you know, it, it helps. It's not a compliant issue, but it does help when a department district agency governmental unit comes together with their park foundation and develop a, a memorandum of understanding, uh, you know, who does what, who's expected to do what. But, you know, when, when you have that MOU, you really have the basis for working together as a department and as a foundation on the things that will see your parks and rec environment grow over the foreseeable future into the next generation. Let me explain just a little bit farther about that. So when, when you have this, this inclusive culture and your, the, your, your park department establishes their long range master plan, if the park foundation is involved, not in putting it together or even approving it, but is involved in the process of, then the park foundation can start to realize what projects are within the wheelhouse of that particular uh, park foundation yep. and begin the, the, the opportunity to strategize on how they're going to put philanthropy and make philanthropy a part of that particular um, you know, enhancement to the park. Which leads me to one last thing, perhaps maybe I'll, I'll suggest, and that is the, the strategic plan of a park foundation, right? Yeah. Um, some of them are, some of them, some of our local park foundations call their strategic plan their budget, while others call the strategic plan something that is really a plans and actions document that keeps things moving forward in your park department, but keeps things inclusive within the park department agency and district. Does that, does that make sense? So, so wrapping it all up, I think that, you know, what we see here is, you know, know the process of starting your foundation, obviously, uh, have a great relationship with the agency that governs that same, you know, regional property, um, have a plan uh, and, and use that plan um, along with in ensuring that you have all of your policies and procedures available to and acknowledged by every board member. That is to me sounds like a very quick version of what we've just talked about over the last yeah. 25 minutes. And I can't believe 25 minutes have already passed. It. It, it goes by so quick. Last, let me add one last thing. I know we're cut short on time. Look, you've probably heard, I know I've said, I've say it a lot. And, and one of our, our colleagues, Dr. Nathan Shamleffel from Terre Haute, Indiana, Indiana State, um, he often says, tr culture, Trump's strategy. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the inclusive culture, that's really important. It doesn't matter how strong the Park Foundation strategic plan is. If they aren't involved in the culture, it weakens that particular strategic plan and its effectiveness. One other last thing as well, don't lose sight of the fact that regardless of how well your Park Foundation is doing, always continue to do training training of your board members, training of your volunteers. Always remember to do training of even the park staff to ensure that new people coming into the park staff know that there's a park foundation and know that there's a mission to that park foundation. Training well, is a big piece of sustainability. And, and that brings me to the pitch, and that is that the National Association of Park Foundations is standing by right now to help your agency or your current foundation and agency do all the things that we've talked about here in this podcast today. We can help you get your 501c3 started. We can help you be begin to build that board and train that board of directors. We can help and work with the agency as they liaise with the Park Foundation. We can work with you to create that memo of understanding that uh, Donald talked about that really guides the uh, relationship between the agency and the foundation. And then we can also help you with your strategic plan. Uh, because that's also important is to have a plan and stick to the plan um, and uh, and make sure that everybody knows what the plan is. I want to 
thank my guest today, uh, Donald Ortal, the previous executive director of the National Association of Park Foundations for joining me. And if you have any needs or information, if you'd like to get in contact with Donald, you can reach out to me, be happy to put you in contact with him or uh, ask any questions of me. You know, the, the website address is, again is v-napf.org. We appreciate you. Thank you, Donald, for coming on today. Thank you very much for having me. Good luck and continued success. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. I appreciate that. We'll see everyone on the next Foundation, the Park People podcast. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for tuning into The Foundation, a Parks People podcast. If you like what you heard, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at the NAPF to not miss an episode. To help this podcast grow, please like, comment, and share with your friends. Have a great day.